pleasure in life. Her too. I mean, she's out of doors catching the little birds. Oh, and here you are sitting inside the live long day like a nun in a nunnery and no pleasure in life at all. Just you think, now and, and a whole year's gone by since you set foot outside the house. Nor shall I set foot outside it ever. Why should I? My life is over. He is lying in his grave and I have entombed myself within these four walls. We have both died. Oh, hark at you, that I should hear such, such things. Look, your husband's dead, and there it is. It was God's will. And may his soul rest in peace. You've, you've grieved your grief, and that's enough. I mean, it's time to put it to an end. You can't weep and, and wear your weeds forever. I... I I had a wife, too, in my day, and, and she died, and uh, what did I do? I, I grieved and wept a month, and that was enough, enough of her. <laughs> well, my whole life away? <laughs> Even my old lady wasn't worth that. <sighs> You've forgotten all your neighbors. You won't go to them. You, you won't let them come to you. Forgive me, but we live like spiders. We never see the white light of day. The mice have eaten our livery. I mean, it would be one thing if there was no folk of the right sort hereabouts, but the district's full of gentlemen. There's a regiment in town, and the officers, I sugar plum, every one, a delight to the eye. Every Friday in their camps, a, a regiment ball. Every day, a, a brass band playing. Oh, madam, my dear, dear madam. Oh, young and lovely, as blooming as strawberries and cream. If only you could take your pleasure in life. Looks don't last forever. <laughs> Ten years from now, you'll be the one wanting to show off your fine feathers to the officers. You'll be the one wanting to throw dust in their eyes, and, well, then, then it'll be too late. Please never mention it again. Since my husband died, as you know, life has lost all meaning for me. You look at me, and I seem alive, but seem to be is all it is. I swore on his grave never to come out of mourning and never to look upon the light of day. Do you understand? Let his shade see how I love him. All right, I know it is no secret from you that he treated me badly, that he was cruel to me, even, yes, unfaithful to me. But I shall be faithful unto the grave. I shall prove to him that I am capable of love and he'll see it last from beyond the tomb exactly what sort of woman I was. Oh, better to take a walk in the garden than to say such things. Better to have Toby and Giant harnessed up and call on your neighbors. Oh, oh madam, sweet <laughs> madam. Oh, what is this now? Oh, oh he loves Toby. He loved Toby so much. He always rode Toby when he was going over to the Korkagans or the Last Horse. He was such a wonderful horseman. Such a graceful bearing as he hauled all his might on the reins. You remember, oh, Toby. See that he's given an extra handful of oats today. Yes, ma'am. An urgent peal on the doorbell. What is that? Tell them I'm not at home. Very good, ma'am. You watch, Nikolai. See, I'm capable of love and forgiveness. While I have breathe, while I have breath in my body, while this poor heart of mine still beats, my love will never die. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Here I am, locking myself away like a nice, good little wife, and being faithful to you unto the grave. And there you are. 
Well, you should be ashamed of yourself. Deceiving me, causing scenes, leaving me on my own for weeks at a time. Madame, it's someone asking for you. He wants to see you. You told him, I presume, that I have been at home to no one since my husband's died? I, I did so, but he wouldn't pay no heed. He says it's a very pressing matter. I am not at home. I, I, I told him, that, but, but all he does is, is swear, the great hobgoblin, and he comes barging in. He's got into the dining room. Very well. Show him in then such boorishness. How tedious these people are. What do they want with me? Why must they intrude upon me? No, I see. I shall have to retire to a nunnery in good earnest. A nunnery. Yes. Why not? Enter Luca and Smyrnog, a landowner in the prime of life. Lockhead, talk too much. That's your trouble. Jackass. <clears throat> Allow me to introduce myself. Smirnov. Grigory Stepanovich Smirnov, landowner and lieutenant of artillery, retired. Uh, I, I am obliged to trouble you on a matter of extreme urgency. What do you want? Your late husband, with whom I had the honor to be acquainted, left debts outstanding on two notes of hand in my favor, amounting to 100 rubles, 1,200 rubles. Since the interest of my mortgage falls due tomorrow, I should be grateful if you would pay me the money today. 1,200 rubles? And how did my husband incur these debts? Oh, he used to buy oats off of me. <sighs> Yes. Luca, don't forget to tell them to give Toby an extra handful of oats today. If my husband left debts to you, then of course I shall pay them. Forgive me though, I have no money in hand today. My steward will be back from town the day after tomorrow and I will have him pay you what you're owed. But until then, I cannot oblige. In addition to which, it is exactly seven months today since my husband died, and I am in no mood to concern myself with money matters. If you don't pay the interest, if you don't pay the interest tomorrow, however, I'm, I'm in a mood to go head over heels in bankruptcy court. They're going to seize my land. You will get your money the day after tomorrow. I don't need it the day after tomorrow. I need it today. Forgive me, but I can't pay it today. And I can't wait until the day after tomorrow. I, but what can I do if I haven't got it? So you can't pay it then? I can't pay it. Yeah. And that's your final word? That's my final word. Positively your final word? Positively my final word. <clears throat> My most humble thanks. I shan't forget this. And they still expect me to keep calm about it. <laughs> I've just met the tax collector on the way here. Grigory Stepanovich, he says, why are you always in such a temper? Well, for pity's sake, how could I not be in such a temper? I'm desperate for money. I started out yesterday at the crack of dawn, went around to everyone who owes me. Not one of them paid up. Got tired. Spent the night next to a vodka barrel in some godforsaken tavern, wind up here, 40 miles from home, think I'll get my hands on something at last, and I'm greeted with not in the mood. Temper, of course I'm in a temper. I made myself quite clear, I think. My steward will be back from town, and then you'll get your money. I haven't come to see your steward, I've come to see you. Why, by all the flaming devils of hell, pardon my language, why should I want to see your steward? My dear sir, forgive me. 
I am not accustomed to these curious turns of phrase, but not being spoken to in that tone of voice, this is as much as I am prepared to listen to. How about that? Not in the mood. <laughs> Seven months ago, her husband died. What about me, though? Have I got to pay my interest or haven't I? Hmm? I'm asking you, have I or haven't I? All right, your husband's dead. You're not in the mood on all the rest of it. Your steward's gone off somewhere. Damn him, what am I supposed to do? Wave my creditors goodbye from a hot air balloon. Take a running jump and bash my head against the wall. I go to see Grustyov. <laughs> he's not in. Yurosevich, he's gone into hiding. I curse Karitsyn halfway to hell and practically throw him out the window. matazov has got cholera and this one's... Not in the mood. None of them will pay up the swine. And all because I've mollycoddled them. All because I'm a babe in arms, a weak woman, a spineless toe rag. I've been too soft with them. Oh, just you wait, though. You'll find out who you're dealing with. They're not going to make a fool out of me, damn them. I'm going to stay here until she pays up. I'm in such a rage today. Such a rage. My knees are shaking. I can't breathe. Lord, I'm feeling positively faint with rage. Fellow. Yes, uh, sir? Water? Uh. Oh, no, but the logic of it. A man's desperate for money, ready to hang himself, and, and she won't pay up because, oh, dear me, <laughs> she's not inclined to concern herself with money matters. <laughs> A real piece of feminine logic. That's precisely why I have never liked and will never like talking with women. I'd rather sit on a barrel of gunpowder. Oh! Her and her fancy dress. Oh, they made me so cross I can feel shivers going up and down my spine. I, I just uh, have to see one of the fair sex in the distance and I, I go all cramps in my legs. Insufferable tribe. Um, <clears throat> Madame is, um, <clears throat> indisposed. <laughs> She's not receiving. What? Uh, Get out! <clears throat> indisposed. Not receiving. <laughs> All right, my precious. Don't receive. I'm going to stay right here until you hand over the money. Be indisposed for a week, if you like. I'll stay here for a week. Indisposed for a year, I'll stay here for a year. <laughs> I'm going to have what's mine. You won't soften my heart by being all in black or having dimples in your cheeks. <laughs> no, we know all about dimples. <laughs> Semyon, unharness. We shan't be leaving for some time. I'm staying here. Go to the stables. You, 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 you've tangled up the reins again. You, 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 you scumbag. Oh. <laughs> never worry, sir. Oh, I'll give you never worry. I feel terrible. Intolerant heat. No one's paying up. Rotten night's sleeping, and now this woman in fancy dress who's not in the mood. <laughs> My head's aching. Perhaps I should have a glass of vodka. <laughs> oh, perhaps I should. Hello! Yes, um, sir? Vodka! Vodka. <clears throat> mm. oh. Must 
admit I'm a bit of a sight. <sighs> Covered in dust, mud all over my boots. <laughs> Have another wash or a comb through my hair. Straw in my waistcoat. <laughs> Maybe she took me for a bandit. Huh? Hmm. Not very polite. Appearing in someone's drawing room in this state. Well, never mind, though. Hmm. I'm not here as a guest. I'm here as a creditor. And no one's laid out the correct wear for creditors. Uh. <coughs> Vodka. <clears throat> Very much at home. You're making yourself, sir. <coughs> what? Uh, no, 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 look, I never meant, <laughs> I, I, I only meant- uh, Who do you think you're talking to? Hold your tongue! <clears throat> He's come down on our heads like a plague, he has, the great hobgoblin, sent by the devil himself, this one. <laughs> oh, what a rage I'm in. Such a rage I, I could grind the whole world to powder. Downright faint! with rage. My Bella. dear sir, I've long since grown unaccustomed in my isolation to the sound of the human voice and I cannot bear shouting. <clears throat> I earnestly beseech you to end this intrusion. Well, pay me the money and I'll go. I've told you quite plainly, I have no money to hand at present. You must wait until the day after tomorrow. Hmm. And I also had the honor to tell you quite plainly, I don't need the money the day after tomorrow. I need it today. If you don't pay me the money today, then tomorrow there will be nothing for it but to hang myself. But what can I do if I haven't got the money? Such an extraordinary way to behave. So, so, you're not going to pay me now? No? I can't. Well, in that case, I shall stay here until I get it. <laughs> you're going to pay me the day after tomorrow? Fine. I'll sit here like this until the day after tomorrow. Stay set. Mm. Precisely. So. Listen, have I got to pay the interest tomorrow or haven't I? Or, or do you think this is all some kind of joke? My dear sir, I must ask you not to shout. We're not in the stables. I'm not talking about stables. I'm simply asking you. Have I got to pay the interest tomorrow or haven't I? You don't know how to behave in the company, in female company. I most certainly do know how to behave in female company. No, you don't. You are coarse, ill brought up. Decent people don't speak to women like so. Oh, but this is amazing. How do you want me to talk to you? In French, perhaps? Je vous prie. Utterly enchanting that you will not pay the rent. Oh, pardon for troubling you. <laughs> what utterly enchanting weather today. In black. Is absolutely your color. That's coarse and not very funny. Coarse and not very funny. <laughs> and I don't know how to behave in female company. <laughs> Madam, I have seen more women in my time than you've seen sparrows. The duels I have fought over women, 12 women I have thrown over and been thrown over by nine more. Oh yes. Now there was a time I behaved like an idiot when I was all sweet words and soft music, all scattered pearls and clicking heels, I loved. I suffered. I sighed to the moon. I felt weak at the knees. I melted. I went hot and cold. I loved passionately. I loved desperately. I loved all the ways there are to love God help me. 
I chattered like a magpie uh, about the emancipation of women, spent half my substance to the tender passion, but now, no thank you. You won't catch me like that now, I've had enough. Huh? Dark mysterious eyes and scarlet lips and dimples. Moonlight, uh, whispers, panting breath. Madam, I wouldn't give you a brass kopeck for the lot of it. Women, huh. from the highest to the lowest, present company accepted, of course, they are all hypocrites, fakers, gossip mongers, grudge bearers, and liars, down to their fingertips. All vain and petty-minded and merciless, their logical powers are a disgrace. And as for what's in here, well, forgive me if I'm frank, but a chaffinch could knock spots off any philosopher in a skirt. Look at one of the so-called gentle sex, and what do you see? Hmm? Fine muslins and ethereal essences, a goddess walking on the earth, a million delights. But look into her heart, and what is she then? A common or garden crocodile. Hmm. He seizes the back of a chair, which splinters and breaks. But the most outrageous thing of all, this crocodile, for some reason, thinks its crowning achievement, its privilege and monopoly, is the tender passion. Ah! Because you can hang me up by my heels, damn it, if any woman knows how to love anything but a lapdog. All a woman can do in love is whimper and snivel where a man suffers and sacrifices. All a woman's love consists of is swirling her skirt around and leading him ever more firmly by the nose. You have the misfortune to be a woman, so you know what women are like. Have you, tell me, in all honesty, have you ever seen a woman who could be sincere and constant and true? Hmm. No, you haven't. The only ones who are constant and true are old crones and freaks. You'll find a horned cat or a white woodcock before you'll find a constant woman. So who, in your opinion, if I may ask, is a constant and true in love? Not a man, by any chance? A man. Certainly, a man. A man. <laughs> a man! Constant and true in love! News to me, I must say. What right do you have to talk to me in such a thing? Constant and true, men? If that's what you're telling me, then let me inform you that of all the men I have ever known, the best was my late husband. I loved him passionately. I loved him with my whole being, as only a young and intelligent woman can love. I gave him my youth and happiness, my life and fortune. I breathed him. I worshipped him like a heathen. And what happened? This best of men deceived me shamelessly at every step. After his death, I found a whole drawer in his desk full of love letters. And while he was alive, I can scarcely bear to recall it. He left me on my own for weeks at a time. He pursued other women in front of my eyes. He betrayed me, squandered my money right and left. He mocked my feelings. And in spite of it all, I love him and I was true to him and dead as he is, I remain true and constant. I have entombed myself forever within these four walls and I shall wear this mourning unto my grave. <laughs> mourning. <laughs> oh, what do you take me for? As if I didn't know why you were wearing this dress or why you'd shut yourself up inside these four walls <laughs> oh yes because it's mysterious and poetic <laughs> some young moon calf in cadet school goes past the estate some half pint poet and and he thinks oh, there she is 
Oh, the mysterious lady who shut herself up and within four walls for love of her husband. Oh. What? We all know your tricks. How dare you say such things to me? You've buried yourself alive, but you haven't forgotten to powder your nose. How dare you talk to me like this? Now, don't shout at me, thank you. I'm not your steward. I'll call a spade a spade, if you please. I'm not a woman, and I'm accustomed to speaking my mind. So kindly stop your shouting. I'm not shouting, you're shouting. Kindly go away and leave me alone. Give me the money and I'll go. I won't give you the money. Oh, yes, you will. Not a kopeck. So there. You can just go away and leave me alone. Well. I don't have the pleasure of being your husband or your fiancé, so don't you make scenes at me, if you please. I don't like it. You've sat yourself down. I have. Please go. Give me the money. Oh, I'm in such a rage, such a rage. I have no desire to converse with impertinent hobble boys. Kindly get out of here. You won't go. No. No? No. Very well, then. Luca, show the gentleman out. Um. I, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> well, um, will, will, will you go away and, and uh, uh, when you're told? I mean, there's nothing here for you. Hold your tongue. Who do you think you're talking to? <clears throat> I'll chop you up for salad. Oh, oh, <laughs> Ooh, load of bum. I, for all the saints, I, you know, I'm going to pass right out. I, uh, ooh, I, <laughs> I really can't breathe. <laughs> Where's Dasha then? Dasha! Dasha! Oh, I, oh, oh no, 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 you lout! You monster! I beg your pardon. What did you say? I said you're a bear. You're a monster. What right do you have, may I ask, to insult me? Yes, I'm insulting you. What of it? I think... You think you're, I'm frightened of you? And you think you can go around insulting people with impunity, do you, just because you're a woman? I demand satisfaction. Oh, above, just, oh by all the saints. Can, can I please get some water? <laughs> With pistols. You think I'm frightened of you just because you've got ham hands and a throat like a bull? Do you? You utter lout. Oh, I'm going to have satisfaction. I don't permit anyone to insult me, and I don't give a straw if you're a member of the weaker sex. You bear, you bear, you bear! High time we gave up our narrow-minded view that only men should pay for their insults. If you want equality, then let's have equality, and to hell with it, just give me satisfaction! You want to fight a duel by all means! Here and now! Here and now, my husband left a pair of pistols. I'll go and get them. It will give me the greatest pleasure to put a bullet in your wooden head. To hell with you! <clears throat> I'll wing her like a chicken. I'm not some sentimental young puppy. There's no weaker sex as far as I'm concerned. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet, kind, sir. <laughs> Have pity on, on, on this man and, uh, and go away from here. I mean, <laughs> you have frightened me to death and now you're going to start fighting duels. Fighting duels. <laughs> now, there really is equality. That really is the emancipation of women. <laughs> Both sexes level. I'll shoot her on principle. To 
what sort of woman is she, huh? To hell with you! I'll put a bullet in your thick wooden head. <laughs> what sort of woman is that? She went quite red. Her eyes flashed. She took up the challenge. On my soul, I've never seen such a thing in my life. Away, sir, just for the love of God, no. Now this is something like a woman. <laughs> this is something that makes sense to me. A real woman. Not some whinging, whining, wishy-washy creature, but fire, gunpowder, sky rockets. Shame to kill her, even! <laughs> dear, dear, good sir, just go away! <laughs> just, just, you, just, just go away, go away! I, I, I've taken a liking to her, <laughs> a positive liking, dimples and all. <laughs> I'm even ready to forgive the debt. <laughs> I'm not in a rage anymore. What an astonishing woman! <laughs> Here are the pistols. <laughs> But before we fight, kindly show me how to use them. I've never held a pistol in my life. God save us. Look, I, you know, I'll go and I'll fetch the gardener and the coachman. Oh, what brought this plague down upon our heads? No. There are various different types of gun to use. These are special Mortimer percussion lock dueling pistols. These are revolvers. Mm. Smith & Wesson system, triple action with extractor, central fire. Fine guns. Worth at least 90 rubles a pair. Now, you hold a revolver like this. Mm. Her eyes, oh, her eyes. She'd start a forest fire with them. Like that? Mm, that's the way. Then you cock it. Uh, take aim like this. Oh, head, head back a little. Extend your arm properly. That's right. And then you press your finger on this little thing. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> Rule number one, don't get excited and don't rush taking aim. <laughs> Try to keep your arm steady. All right. Awkward having a duel indoors. Hmm. We'll go out into the garden. Right. I must warn you though, I, I shall fire into the air. This really is the limit. Why? Because it, well, because it, that's none of your business. What? Lost your nerve? Have you? <laughs> no, sir, you won't get out of it like that. Kindly follow me. I shan't rest until I put a bullet in your head. Into this head right here. <laughs> this loathsome head. <laughs> So, you've lost your nerve, have you? Yes, lost my nerve. You're lying. Mm -hmm. Why don't you want to fight? Because I, because I, I've taken a liking to you. He's taken a liking to me. <laughs> he has the gall to say he's taken a liking to me. Please. Smirnov silently lays down his revolver, takes his cap, and goes. He stops at the door, and for a while, they look at each other in silence. Then he goes uncertainly across to her. Listen. Are you still angry with me? 
I, I'm as cross as two sticks myself, but the thing is, well, how can I put it? Uh, listen, the fact is, not to mince words, uh, uh, well, this is rather a how do you do, and it's, uh, I mean, is it my fault that I like you? He seizes the back of a chair, which splinters and breaks. <laughs> Very fragile furniture you've got down it. I like you. Uh, you see, I'm, I'm rather in love with you. Get away from me. I hate you. Oh my God, but what a woman. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it in my life. I'm finished. I'm done for. Caught like a mouse in a mouse trap. Get back or I'll fire. <laughs> oh, fire away. <laughs> you don't know what happiness it would bring me to die in the sight of those miraculous eyes. To be shot by a revolver held by this tiny soft hand. <laughs> oh, I've gone mad. <laughs> Decide now, because if I leave, we are never going to see each other again. I'm a landowner, a decent sort, 10,000 a year, fine, stable, hit a copic in the air. Will you be my wife? I, I demand satisfaction. I've gone completely mad. Don't know what I'm doing. Fellow, water. Give me satisfaction. Mad as a hatter, fallen in love like a schoolboy. He seizes her hand. Ah! I love you. <laughs> I love you as I've never loved before. Twelve women I've thrown over, been thrown over by nine more, but not one of them I loved the way that I love you. Turned into a heap of jelly. <laughs> Here I am, kneeling like an idiot, offering you my hand. I should be ashamed of myself. I haven't fallen in love for five years, swore to high heaven. And now, all of a sudden, head over heels like a hunter off a horse. I'm proposing to you. Yes or no? Don't want to? Then don't! He gets up and goes quickly across to the door. Well? Nothing. Oh. Go. Or, or rather, wait. No, no, go. Go. I hate the sight of you. Or, no, don't go. Oh, if you only knew what, what a rage I'm in. Uh, what a tearing rage. Throws the revolver down on the table. Oh, my fingers are all swollen from that horrible thing. What are you standing there for? Get out! Farewell. Yes, yes. Off you go, then. Where are you going? Wait a moment. Oh, be off with you, heaven. I'm in such a rage. Don't, don't come near me. Don't come near me. I'm in a great rage myself. <laughs> Fallen in love like a schoolboy, got down on my knees, gone hot and cold all over. I love you! That's the last thing I need, to go falling in love with you. I've got interest to pay. I've got to get the hay in, and now you, on top of it all. He puts his hand round her waist. <laughs> I'll never forgive myself for this. Get away from me. Take your hands off me. I hate you. I demand satisfaction. A prolonged kiss. Enter Luca holding an axe. Oh, Lord, preserve us. Luca? Tell them in the stables. No oaths for Toby's today. Oh. Curtain. Overruled by George Bernard Shaw. 
A lady and gentleman are sitting together on a Chesterfield in a retired corner of the lounge of a seaside hotel. The lady is young, that is, one feels sure that she is under 35 and over 24. The gentleman does not look much older. He is obviously very much in love with the lady and is, in fact, yielding to an irresistible impulse to throw his arms around her. Don't! Oh, don't be horrid, please, Mr. Lunn. She rises from the lounge and retreats behind it. Promise me you won't be horrid. I'm not being horrid, Mrs. Juno. I'm, I'm not going to be horrid. I love you. That's all. I'm extraordinarily happy. You will really be good? I'll be whatever you wish me to be. I tell you, I love you. I love loving you. I don't want to be tired and sorry as I should be if I were to be horrid. I don't want you to be tired and sorry. Do come and sit down again. You're sure you don't want anything you oughtn't to? Quite sure. I only want you. Don't be alarmed. I like wanting you. As long as I have a want, I have a reason for living. Satisfaction is death. Yes, but the impulse to commit suicide is sometimes irresistible. No, not with you. What? Oh, uh, it sounds uncomplimentary, but it isn't really. Do you know why half the couples who find themselves situated as we now behave horridly? Because they can't help it if they let things go too far? Not a bit of it. It's because they have nothing else to do and no other way of entertaining each other. You don't know what it's like to be alone with a woman who has little beauty and less conversation. What is a man to do? If you can't talk interestingly, and if he talks that way himself, she doesn't understand him. He can't look at her. If he does, he only finds out that she isn't beautiful. Before the end of five minutes, they are both hideously bored. There's only one thing that can save the situation, and that's what you call being horrid. With a beautiful witty, kind woman. There's no time for such follies. It's delightful to look at her, to listen to her voice, to hear all she has to say, that nothing else happens. That is why the woman who is supposed to have a thousand lovers seldom has one, whilst the stupid, graceless animals of women have dozens. I wonder. It's quite true that when one feels in danger, one talks like mad to stave it off, even when one doesn't quite want to stave it off. One never does quite want to stave it off. Danger is delicious, but death isn't. We caught the danger, but the real delight is in escaping, after all. I don't think we'll talk about it anymore. Danger is all very well when you do escape, but sometimes one doesn't. I tell you frankly, I don't feel as safe as you do, if you really do. Oh, but surely you can do as you please without injuring anyone, Mrs. Juno? That is the whole secret of your extraordinary charm to me. I don't understand. Well, I hardly know how to begin to explain. But the root of the matter is that I am what people call a good man. I thought so until you began making love to me. But you knew I loved you all along. Yes, of course, but I depended on you not to tell me so. Because I thought you were good. Your blurting it out spoiled it, and it was wicked besides. No, not at all. You see, it's a great many years since I've been allowed, uh, been able to allow myself to fall in love. I know lots of charming women, but the worst of it is, they're all married. Women don't become charming to my taste until they're really fully developed. And by that time, if they're really nice, they're snapped up and married. And then, because I am a good man, I have to place a limit to my regard for them. I may be fortunate enough to gain friendship and even very warm affection for them, but my loyalty to their husbands and their hearts and their happiness obliges me to draw a line and not overstep it. Of course, I value such uh, affectionate regard as very highly indeed. I am surrounded with women who are most dear to me, but 
every one of them has a, a post sticking up, if I may put it that way, with, with the inscription, trespassers will be prosecuted. How we all loathe that notice in every lovely garden, in every dell full of primroses, on every fair hillside we meet that confounded board and there's always a gamekeeper around the corner. But what is that to the horror of meeting it on every beautiful woman and knowing that there is a husband around the corner? I have had this accursed board standing between me and every dear and desirable woman until I thought I had lost the power of letting myself fall really and wholeheartedly in love. Wasn't there a widow? No. Widows are extraordinarily scarce in modern society. Husbands live longer than they used to and even when they do die their widows have a string of names down for the next. Well, what about the young girls? Oh, who cares for young girls? They're unsympathetic. They're beginners. They don't attract me. I'm afraid of them. That is the correct thing to say to a woman of my age. But it doesn't explain why you seem to have put your scruples in your pockets when you met me. Surely that's quite clear. I... No, please don't explain. I don't want to know. I take your word for it. Besides, it doesn't matter now. Our voyage is over. And tomorrow I start for the north to my poor father's estate. Your poor father? I thought he was alive. So he is. What made you think he wasn't? Well, you, you said your poor father. Oh, that's a trick of mine. <laughs> Rather a silly trick, I suppose. But there's something pathetic to me about men. I find myself calling them poor so-and-so, and there's nothing whatsoever the matter with them. But, but, but I... Is... Well, I... Oh, Lord! What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing? Nonsense, you're ill. No, it would... <laughs> there was something about your late husband. My late husband? What do you mean? <gasps> don't tell me he's dead! Just don't tell me he's alive! <laughs> don't frighten me like this! Of course he's alive! Unless you've heard anything? The first day we met on the boat, you spoke of me, of your your poor dear husband. Is that all? Well, afterwards you called him poor Tops. Always poor Tops. Oh, oh poor dear Tops. What could I think? I wish you hadn't given me such a shock about him. For I haven't been treating him at all well. Neither have you. Uh, and you mean to tell me you're not a widow? Gracious, no. I'm not in black. Well, then I have been behaving like a blackguard. Uh, I've broken my promise to my mother. I shall never have an easy conscience again. I'm sorry. I, I thought you knew. You thought I was a libertine? No! Of course I shouldn't have spoken to you if I had thought that. I thought you liked me, but that you knew and would be good. I, I thought... The burden of being good has fallen from my soul at last. I saw nothing here but a bosom to rest on, the bosom of a lovely woman of whom I could dream without guilt. What do I see now? Just what you saw before. No. No. What else? Trespassers will be prosecuted. Trespassers will be prosecuted. They won't if they hold their tongues. Don't be such a coward. My husband won't eat you. I'm not afraid of your husband. I'm afraid of my conscience. Well, I don't consider myself at all a badly behaved woman, for nothing has passed between us that was not perfectly nice and friendly. But really, to hear a grown man talking about promises to his mother. Yes, yes, I know all about that. It's not romantic, it's not Don Juan, it's not advanced, but we feel it all the same. It's far deeper in our blood and bones than all the romantic stuff. My father got into a scandal once, and that's why my mother made me promise never to make love to a married woman, and now I've done it, I can't feel honest. Don't pretend to despise or, or laugh at me, you feel it too. You said 
just now, your own conscience was uneasy when you thought of your husband. What must it be to think of my wife? Your wife? You don't dare sit there and tell me coolly that you are a married man. I never led you to believe I was unmarried. Oh, you never gave me the faintest hint that you had a wife. I did indeed. I discussed things with you that only married people really understand. Oh. I thought it was the most delicate way of letting you know. Well, you are a daisy, I must say. I suppose that's vulgar, but really, really, you and your goodness. However, now we have found one another out, there's only one thing to be done. Will you please go? I ought to go. Well, go! Yes. Uh... I, I somehow can't. My, my conscience is, is active. My will is paralyzed. This is really dreadful. Would you mind ringing the bell and asking them to throw me out? You ought to, you know. What? And make a scandal in the face of the hotel? Certainly not. Don't be a fool. Yes, but I can't go. Then I can. Goodbye. Uh, can you really? Of course I. Oh dear, I can't. Don't for heaven's sake, pull yourself together. It's a question of, of self-control. No, it's a question of distance. Self-control is all very well two or three yards off or on a ship with everybody looking on. Don't come any nearer. No, this is a ghastly business. I want to go away and I can't. I think you ought to go. But, if you try to, I shall grab you round the neck and disgrace myself. I implore you to sit still and be nice. Do I implore you to run away? I believe I can trust myself to let you go for your own sake. But it, it will break my heart. I don't want to break your heart. I can't bear to think of your sitting here alone. I can't bear to think of myself sitting here alone. It's so senseless, so ridiculous, and we might be so happy. Oh, I don't want to be wicked, of course, but I like you very much, and I do want to be affectionate and human. I ought to draw a line. So you shall, dear. Uh, tell me, do you really like me? I don't mean love me. You might love the housemaid. But no. Oh, yes, you might. And what does that matter, anyhow? Are you really fond of me? Are we friends, comrades? Would you be sorry if I died? Oh, don't. I... Or was it the usual aimless man's lark? A mere shipboard flirtation? Oh, no, no. Nothing half as bad, so vulgar, so wrong. I, I assure you, I only meant to be agreeable. <laughs> I, it grew on me before I noticed it. And you were glad to let it grow? I let it grow because the board was not up. Oh, father the board, I'm just as fond of Sibthorpe as. Sibthorpe? Oh, Sibthorpe is my husband's Christian name. I oughtn't to call him Topstein now. <laughs> it sounded like something to drink, but I, I have no right to laugh at him. My Christian name is Gregory, which sounds like a powder. That is so like a man. I offer you my heart's warmest, friendliest feeling, and you think of nothing but a silly joke. A quip like that makes you forget me. Forget you? Oh, if, if only I could. If you could, would you? No. Oh, I die first. Oh, I hate myself. I glory in myself. It's so jolly to be reckless. Can a man be reckless, I wonder? D d no, I'm not reckless. I know w what I'm doing. My, my conscience is awake. Where is the intoxication of love, the, the delirium, the madness that makes a man think the world well lost for the woman he adores? I don't think anything of the sort. I see that it's not worth it. I, I know that it's wrong. I, I have never in my life been cooler, more businesslike. 
But you can't resist me. I must. I ought. Oh, my darling, my treasure, we shall be sorry for this. We can forgive ourselves. Could we forgive ourselves if we let this moment slip? I protest to the last. I am against this. I have been pushed over a precipice. I am innocent. Wild joy, this, this exquisite tenderness, this is a ascent into heaven can thrill me to the utmost fiber of my heart. But it, it can't subdue my mind or corrupt my conscience, which still shouts to the skies that I'm not a willing party to this outrageous conduct. I repudiate the bliss with which you are filling me. Never mind your conscience. Tell me how happy you are. No, I recall you to your duty. But, oh, I will give you my life with both hands if you can tell me how, if you feel for me one millionth of a part what I feel for you right now. Oh, yes, yes, be satisfied with that. Ask for more. No more. Let me go. Oh, I can't. I have no will. Something stronger than neither of us is in command here. Nothing on earth or in heaven can part us now. You know that, don't you? Oh, don't make me say it. Of course I know. Nothing, nor life, nor death, nor shame, nor anything can part us. All right, this must be it. The two recover with a violent start and spring back to opposite sides of the lounge. That did it. Shh! That was my husband's voice! Oh, Impossible, it's only our guilty fancy. This is the way to the lounge, I know it. Great heavens, we're both mad. That's my wife's voice. Ridiculous! Oh, we're dreaming at all! The door opens, and Sipthorpe Juno appears in the roseate glow of the corridor, which happens to be papered in pink, with Mrs. Lunn, a town houser in the Hill of Venice. Venus. He is fussily energetic little man who gives himself an air of gallantry by greasing the points of his moustache and dressing very carefully. She is a tall, imposing, handsome, languid woman with flashing dark eyes and long lashes. They make for the Chesterfield, not noticing the two palpitating figures blotted against the walls in the gloom on either side. The figures flit away noiselessly through the window and disappear. Ah, here we are. Sit down, I'm sure you're tired. That's right. Hello. The sofa's quite warm. Is it? I don't notice it. I expect the sun's been on it. I felt it quite distinctly. I'm more thinly clad than you. Oh, what a relief to get off the ship and have a private room. That's the worst of a ship. You're under observation all the time. But why not? But, well, of course, there's no reason. At least I suppose not. But, you know, part of the romance of a journey is that a man keeps imagining that something might happen. And he can't do that. If there are a lot of people about and it simply can't happen. Mr. Juno, romance is all very well on board ship, but when your foot touches the soil of England, there's an end to it. No. Believe me, that's a foreigner's mistake. We are the most romantic people in the world, we English. Why, my very presence here is a romance. Indeed. Yes. You've guessed, of course, that I'm a married man. Oh, that's all right. I'm a married woman. Thank heaven for that. To my English mind, passion is not real passion without guilt. I am a red-blooded man, Mrs. Lunn. I can't help it. The tragedy of my life is that I married, when quite young, a woman whom I couldn't help being very fond of. I longed for a guilty passion, for the real thing, the wicked thing. And yet I couldn't care tuppence for any other woman when my wife was about. Year after the year went by, I felt my youth slipping away without ever having had a romance in my life. The marriage is all very well, but it isn't romance. There's nothing wrong in it, you see. Oh, poor man, how you must have suffered. No, that was what was so tame about it. I wanted to suffer. You get so sick of being happily married. It's always the happy marriages that break up. At last, my wife and I agreed that we ought to take a holiday. Hadn't you holidays every year? Oh, the seaside and so on. That's not what we meant. We meant a holiday from one another. 
How very odd. She said it was an excellent idea. The domestic felicity was making it perfectly idiotic, but she wanted a holiday too. So we agreed to go round the world in opposite directions. I started for Suez on the day she sailed for New York. Oh, that's precisely what Gregory and I did. Now I wonder, did he want a holiday from me? What he said was that he wanted the delight of meeting me again after a long absence. Could anything be more romantic than that? Would anyone else than an Englishman have thought of it? I dare say my temperament seems tame to your boiling southern blood, but... My what? Your southern blood. Don't you remember how you told me? That night in the saloon when I sang farewell and adieu to you dear Spanish ladies? That you were by birth a lady of Spain? Your splendid Andalusian beauty speaks for itself. Stuff. I was born in Gibraltar. My father was Captain Jenkins. In the artillery? It is climate and not race that determines the temperament. The fiery sun of Spain blazed on your cradle, and it rocked to the roar of British cannon. What eloquence! Now it reminds me of my husband when he was in love. Here before we were married. Are you in love? Yes, and with the same woman. Well, of course, I didn't suppose you were in love with two women. I don't think you quite understand. I meant that I am in love with you. Oh, uh, that. Uh, men do fall in love with me. They all seem to think me a creature with volcanic passions. I'm sure I don't know why, for all the volcanic women I know are plain little creatures with sandy hair. I don't consider human volcanoes respectable, and I'm so tired of the subject. You know, our house is always full of women who are in love with my husband and men who are in love with me. We encourage it because it's pleasant to have company. And is your husband as insensible as yourself? Oh, Gregory's not insensible, very far from it. But I am the only woman in the world for him. But you. Are you really as insensible as you say you are? I never said anything of the kind. I'm not at all insensible by nature, but I don't know whether you've noticed it. I am what people call rather a fine figure of a woman. Noticed it? Oh, Mrs. Lunn. Have I been able to notice anything else since we met? Oh, there you go, like all the rest of them. I ask you, how do you expect a woman to keep up what you call her sensibility when this sort of thing has happened to her about three times a week ever since she was 17? It used to upset me and terrify me at first, and then I got rather a taste for it. it came to a climax with Gregory. That was why I married him. Then it became a mild lark, hardly worth the trouble. And after that, I found it valuable once or twice as a spinal tonic when I was run down, but now? Oh, it's an unmitigated bore. I, I don't mind your declaration. I, I dare say it gives you a certain pleasure to make it. I quite understand that you ignore me, but if you don't mind, I'd rather you didn't keep on saying so. Is there then no hope for me? Oh, yes. Oh, Gregory has an idea that married women keep lists of men they'll marry if they become widows. I'll put your name down if that will satisfy you. Is the list a long one? Do you mean the real list? Not the one I showed to Gregory. Uh, there are hundreds of names on that, but the little private list that um, he'd better not see. Oh, will you really put me on that? Say you will. Well, perhaps I will. He kisses her hand. Now don't begin abusing the privilege. May I call you by your Christian name? No. It's too long. Can't go about calling a woman Seraphita. Seraphita! I used to be called Sally at home, but when I married a man named Lunn, of course, that became ridiculous. That's my one little pet joke. <laughs> Call me Mrs. Lunn for short, and change the subject or I shall go to sleep. I can't change the subject. For me, there is no other subject. Why else have you put me on your list? Because you're a solicitor. Gregory's a solicitor. I I'm accustomed to my husband being a solicitor and telling me things he oughtn't to tell anybody. Is that all? Oh, I can't believe that the voice of love has ever thoroughly awakened you. 
No. It sends me to sleep. It's no use, Mr. Juno. I'm hopelessly respectable. The Jenkinsons always were. Don't you realize that unless most women were like that, the world couldn't go on as it does? Oh, you think it goes on respectably, but I can tell you, as a solicitor... Stuff! It... Of course all the disreputable people who go into, get into trouble go to you, just as all the sick people go to the doctors, but most people never go to a solicitor. Look here, Mrs. Lunn. Do you think a man's heart is a potato, or a turnip, or a ball of knitting wool? And you can throw it away like this. I don't throw away balls of knitting wool. A man's heart seems to me like a sponge. It sops up dirty water as well as clean. I have never been treated like this in my life. Here am I, a married man with a most attractive wife, a wife I adore and who adores me and has never as much as looked at any other woman since we were married. I come and throw all this at your feet. I, I, a solicitor, braving the risk of your husband, putting me into the divorce court and making me a beggar and an outcast. I do this for your sake and you go on as if I were making no sacrifice, as if I had told you it's a fine evening or asked you to have a cup of tea. It's not human, it's not right. Love has its rights as well as respectability. Nonsense. Here, here's a flower. Now go and dream over it until you feel hungry. Nothing brings people to their senses like hunger. What good's this? Oh, you don't love me a bit. Yes, I do. <laughs> or, or at least I did. But I'm an Englishman, and I think you ought to respect the conventions of English life. But I am respecting them, and you're not. Oh, pardon me, pardon me. I may be doing wrong, but I'm doing it in a proper and customary manner. You may be doing right, but you're doing it in an unusual and questionable manner. I am not prepared to put up with that. I can stand being badly treated. I'm no baby and can take care of myself with anybody. And of course, I can stand being well treated. But the one thing I can't stand is being unexpectedly treated. It's outside my scheme of life. So come now, you've got to behave naturally and straightforwardly with me. You can leave husband and child, home, friends and country for my sake, and come with me to some southern isle, or say, South America, where we can be all in all to one another. Or you can tell your husband and let him jolly well punch my head in if he can. But I'm damned if I'm going to stand any eccentricity. It's not respectable. Will you have the goodness, sir, in addressing this lady to keep your temper and refrain from using profane language? Gregory, darling! She enfolds him in a copious embrace. You make love to another man, to my face! Why, he's my husband. That takes away the last <laughs> rag of excuse for such conduct. A nice world it would be if married people were to carry on their endearments before everybody. This is ridiculous. What the devil business is it of yours what passes between my wife and myself? You're not her husband, are you? Oh, not at present, but I'm on the list. I'm her prospective husband. You're only her actual one. I'm the anticipation. You're the disappointment. Oh, my Gregory is not a disappointment. Are you, dear? You just wait, my pet. I'll settle this chap for you. You call me a disappointment, do you? Well, I suppose every husband's a disappointment. What about yourself? You don't look like an unmarried man. I happen to know the lady you disappointed. I travelled in the same ship with her, and... And you fell in love with her. Who told you that? Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh. you confess it. Ah. Well... If you want to know, nobody told me. Everybody falls in love with my wife. <laughs> and do you fall in love with everybody's wife? Certainly not. Only with yours. But what's the good of saying that, Mr. Juno? I'm married to him, and there's the end of it. Not at all. You can get a divorce. What for? For his misconduct with my wife. How dare you, sir? Asperse the character of that sweet lady, a lady whom I have taken under my protection. Protection! Really, you must be more careful what you say about me, Mr. Lunn. My precious. He embraces her. Pardon this betrayal of feeling, but I've not seen my wife for several weeks, and 
she is very dear to me. I call this cheek. Who's making to love to his own wife before people now, pray? Won't you introduce me to your wife, Mr. Juno? How do you do? <sighs> so glad to find you do credit to Gregory's taste. I'm naturally rather particular about the women he falls in love with. This is no way to take your husband's unfaithfulness. You ought to teach your wife better. Where's her feelings? That's scandalous. What about your own conduct, Frey? I don't defend it, and there's an end of the matter. Well, upon my soul, what difference does your not defending it make? A fundamental difference. To serious people, I may appear wicked. I don't defend myself. I am wicked, though not bad at heart. To thoughtless people, I may even appear comic. Well, laugh at me. I have given myself away. But Mrs. Lunn seems to have no opinion at all about me. She doesn't seem to know whether I'm wicked or comic. She doesn't seem to care. She has no moral sense. I say it's not right. I repeat, I have sinned and I'm prepared to suffer. Have you really sinned, Tops? I don't remember your sinning. I have a shocking bad memory for that, for trifles, but I think I should remember that, if you mean me. Trifles! I have fallen in love with a monster. Don't you dare call my wife a monster. Uh, please don't lose your temper, Mr. Lunn. I won't have my tops bullied. Well then, let him not brag about sinning with my wife. What permission does he have to have such, in, what pretension has he for such honour? I sinned in intention. I'm as guilty as if I had actually sinned, and I insist on being treated as a sinner, and not walked over as if I'd done nothing by your wife or any other man. Tosh. I won't be belittled. I hope you'll come and stay with us now that you and Gregory are such friends, Mrs. Juno. Oh, this insane magnanimity! Don't you think you've said enough, Mr. Juno? This is a matter for two women to settle. Won't you take a stroll on the beach with my Gregory while we talk it over? Gregory is a splendid listener. I don't think any good can come of a conversation between Mr. Lunn and myself. We can hardly be expected to improve one another's morals. He passes behind the Chesterfield to Mrs. Lunn's end, seizes a chair, deliberately pushes it between Gregory and Mrs. Lunn, and sits down with folded arms, resolved not to budge. Ooh. Indeed, oh, all right, if you come to that. He crosses to Mrs. Juno, plants a chair by her side, and sits down with equal determination. Now we are both equally guilty. Pardon me, I'm not guilty. Oh, in intention, don't quibble. You were guilty in intention, as I was. No, I should rather describe myself as being guilty in fact, but in fact, but not intention. What? Gregory? Oh, really? Uh, yes, I maintain that I am responsible for my intentions only, and not for reflex actions over which I have no control. I promise my mother that my mother, that I would never tell a lie, and that I would never make love to a married woman. I have never told a lie. Gregory! I say never. On many occasions, I have resorted to prevarications, but on great occasion, I have always told the truth. I regard this as a great occasion. And I won't be intimidated into breaking my promise. I solemnly declare that I did not know until this evening that Mrs. Juno was married. She will, she will bear me out when I say that, and from that moment, my intentions were strictly and resolutely honourable, though my conduct, which I could not control and am therefore not responsible for, was disgraceful, or would have been had this gentleman not walked in and begun making love to my wife under my very nose. Oh, I like this. Really, darling, there's no use in the pot calling the kettle black. Well, when you say darling, may I ask which of us you are addressing? I really don't know. I'm getting hopelessly confused. 
Why don't you let my wife say something? I don't think she ought to be thrust into the background like this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sure. Please excuse me, dear. I don't know what to say. I must think it over. I've always been rather severe on this sort of thing. But when it came to the point, I didn't behave as I thought I should behave. I didn't intend to be wicked, but somehow or other, nature or whatever you choose to call it, didn't make, take much notice of my intentions. And I really did think, Tops, that I was the only woman in the world for you. Oh, that's all right, my precious. Mrs. Lunn thought she was the only woman in the world for him. Mm. Yes, but a sort of way. And so is my wife. Don't you set up to be a better husband than I am, for you're not. I've owned I'm wrong. You haven't. Are you sorry, Gregory? Sorry? Yes, sorry. I think it's time for you to say you're sorry and to make friends with Mr. Juno before we all dine together. Seraphita, I promise my mother... Oh, father, your mother! I beg your pardon. A promise is a promise. I, c I can't tell a deliberate lie. I know I ought to be sorry, but the fat fact is that I'm not sorry. I find that in this business, somehow or other, there's a disastrous separation between my moral principles and my conduct. There's nothing disastrous about it. It doesn't matter about your conduct if your principles are all right. Boss, it doesn't matter about your principles if your conduct is all right. But your conduct isn't all right, and my principles are. Well, what's the good of your principles being right if they don't work? They will work, sir, if you exercise self-sacrifice. Oh, yes. If, if, if. You know jolly well that self-sacrifice doesn't work either when you really want a thing. How much have you sacrificed yourself, pray? Oh, a great deal, Gregory. Don't be rude. Mr. Juno's a very nice man. He has been most attentive to me on the voyage. And Mrs. Juno's a very nice woman. She oughtn't to be, but she is. Why oughtn't she to be a nice woman, pray? I mean, she oughtn't to be nice to me. And you oughtn't to be nice to my wife. And your wife oughtn't to like me. And my wife oughtn't to like you. And if you do, they oughtn't to go on liking us. And I oughtn't to like your wife. And you oughtn't to like mine. And if we do, we oughtn't to go on liking them. But we do. All of us. We oughtn't, but we do. My dear boy, if we admit we are in the wrong, where's the harm of it? We're not perfect, but as long as we keep the ideal before us. Uh, how? By admitting we're wrong. Well, really, I must have my dinner. These two men with their morality and their promises to their mothers and, and their admissions that they're wrong and they're sinning and suffering and they're going on at one another and as if it meant anything or as if it mattered are getting on my nerves. If you will be so very good, my dear, as to take my sentimental husband off my hands occasionally, I shall be more than obliged to you. I'm sure you can stand more male sentimentality than I can. I, on my part, will do my best to amuse your excellent husband when you find him tiresome. I, I call this polyandry. I wish you wouldn't call innocent things by offensive names, Mr. Juno. What do you call your own conduct? I tell you, I have admitted. What's the point of no, keeping I'll on screen at that? Well, well, okay. Listen to me. What is the position now exactly? I mean, what are we going to do? What would you advise, Mr. Juno? I should advise you to divorce your husband. You want me to drag your wife into court and disgrace her? No. I forgot that. E excuse me, but for the moment I thought I was married to you. <laughs> I think we had better let bygones be bygones. You will forgive me, won't you? Or why should you let a moment's forgetfulness embitter our future life? But it's Mrs. Lunn who has to forgive you. Oh. Dash it, I forgot. This is, this is getting ridiculous. I'm getting hungry. Do you really mind, Mrs. Lunn? My dear Mrs. Juno, Gregory is one of those terribly uxorious men who ought to have ten wives. If any really nice woman will take him off my hands for a day or two occasionally, I shall be greatly obliged to her. So, Vita, 
You cut me to the soul. Serve you right. You think it quite proper if it cut me to the soul. Am I to take Slipthorpe off your hands too, Mrs. Lund? Do you suppose I'll allow this? You've admitted that you've done wrong, Tops. What's the use of your allowing or not allowing after that? I do not admit that I have been wrong. I admit that what I did was wrong. Can you explain the distinction? Oh, it's quite plain to anyone but an imbecile. If you tell me I've done something wrong, you insult me. But if you say that something I did is wrong, you simply raise a question of morals. I tell you flatly, if you say I did anything wrong, you will have to fight me. In fact, I think we ought to fight anyhow. I don't particularly want to, but I feel that England expects us to. I won't fight. If you beat me, my wife would share my humiliation. If I beat you, she would sympathize with you and loathe me for my brutality. Not to mention that as we are human beings and not reindeer or bond or fowl, if two men presumed to fight for us, we couldn't decently ever speak to either of them again. Well, besides, neither of us could beat the other, as we neither of us know how to fight. We should only blacken each other's eyes and make fools of ourselves. I don't admit that. Every Englishman can use his fists. You're an Englishman. Can you use yours? I presume so. Ha. Ah. I never tried. I, you never told me you couldn't fight, Tops. I thought you were an accomplished boxer. My precious, I never gave you any ground for such a belief. You always talked as if it were a matter of course. You spoke with the greatest contempt of men who didn't kick each other men down the stairs. Well, I can't kick Mr. Lund downstairs. We're on the ground floor. You could throw him into the harbour. Do you want me to be thrown into the harbour? No! I only want to show Tops that he's making a ghastly fool of himself. We're all making fools of ourselves. Hmm. Well, if we're not to fight, I must insist at least on your never speaking to my wife again. Does my speaking to your wife do you any harm? No, but it's the proper course to take. We must behave with some sort of decency. Are you never going to speak to me again, Mr. Juno? I'm prepared to promise never to do so. I think your husband has a right to demand that. Then if I speak to you after, it will not be his fault. It will be a breach of my promise, and I shall not attempt to defend my conduct. I shall talk to your wife as often as she'll let me. I have no objection to your speaking to me, Mr. Lund. Then I shall take steps. What steps? Oh, steps measures, proceedings, such steps as may seem advisable. Can your husband afford a scandal, Mrs. Juno? No, neither can mine. Mrs. Juno, I'm very sorry I let you in for all this. I don't know how it is that we contrive to make feelings like ours, which seem to me to be beautiful and sacred feelings and which lead to such interesting and exciting adventures end in vulgar squabbles and degrading scenes. I decline to admit that my conduct has been vulgar or degrading. I Look here, old much... chap, I don't say a word against your mother, and I'm sorry she's dead, but really, you know, most women are mothers, and they all die sometime or other, yet that doesn't make them infallible authorities on morals, does it? I was about to say so myself. Let me add that if you do things merely because you think some other fool expects you to do them, and he expects you to do them because he thinks you expect him to do them, it will end in everybody doing what nobody wants to do, which is, in my opinion, a silly state of things. Lung, I love your wife, and that's all about it. Judo, I love yours. What then? Clearly, she must never see you again. Oh, why not? Why not, my love? I'm surprised at you. Am I to speak only to men who dislike me? Yes. I think that is, properly speaking, a married woman's duty. Then I won't do it. That's flat. I like to be liked. I like to be loved. I want everyone around me to love me. I don't want to meet or speak to anyone who doesn't like me. But... But, my precious, this is the most horrible immorality. 
I don't intend to give up meeting you, Mr. Juno. You amuse me very much. I don't like being loved. It bores me, but I do like being amused. I hope we shall meet very often. But I hope also we shall not defend our conduct. This is unendurable. We've all been flirting. Need we go on footling about it? I don't know what you call footling. You do. You're footling. Mr. Lan is footling. Can we admit that we're human and have done with it? I have admitted it all along. I have Then said... stop footling! The dinner gong sounds. Oh! Thank heaven. Let's go into dinner. Gregory, take in Mrs. Juno. But surely I ought to take in our guest and not my own wife. Well, Mrs. Juno is not your wife, is oh, she? Oh, of course. I beg your pardon. I, I'm hopelessly confused. He offers his arm to Mrs. Juno rather apprehensively. You seem quite afraid of me. She takes his arm. I am. I simply adore you. They go out together, and as they pass through the door, he turns and says in a ringing voice to the other couple, I have said to Mrs. Juno that I simply adore her. He takes her out defiantly. Yes, dear, she's a darling. Now, Sibthorpe. Giving her his arm gallantly. You have called me Sibthorpe. Thank you. I think Lund's conduct fully justifies me in allowing you to do it. Yes, I think you may let yourself go now. Seraphita, I worship you beyond expression. Sibthorpe, you amuse me beyond description. Come. They go into dinner together. End of play. We now invite both casts to come back for their bows.